I should also say that today I will only speak about Sweden or Sweden-like countries, rich countries like that. I know about all these global gaps, um, extreme global gaps that we have. Um, there's a Swedish word called lagom. Does anyone speak Swedish here? <laughs> lagom means not too much and not too little. <laughs> and the problem is, of course, where? Why do we find this middle? Um, I have written a book recently and I will base my presentation on that. It's called simply How, can, how We Can Live Sustainably by 2030. It, it was eventually published by the, the Swedish EPA and it can be downloaded. But as I said, it's, it's all in Swedish. Um, I, I want to be practical about it. I say that uh, politicians <laughs> and their voters as such, they usually feel that there will be large changes needed for uh, to live sustainably. And I wanted to suggest that, to say whether, can we really live a modern, comfortable life and still save the world? And this is how I set out to, to calculate it. Uh, but it, if, because it can, if it can be done, we, should, we wouldn't have to be so afraid of suggesting, proposing things to the public, and then we could so sort of go on with the discussion. And I'm an engineer as a background, so also I thought it, I would put so as much figures into it, because figures you can always test, etc. Problem is, of course, that we are very much growth oriented. I use this uh, cover of a book to describe this situation, how people think about growth. It's, it's an actual cover of a book, and you can see that this word growth here is written with very large letters, and you have a, 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 the king, the crown, you have the halo, etc. Everybody understands how important is growth, economic growth. But this was published actually by the EPA and another institution. And if you have very good eyes, you could read here that it says ecologically sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. But this is the way things were regarded, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, and to some extent today. I mean, we still have this, this uh, tag of war between growth and environmental issues. I will speak very much about, about economy, about money, about practical, rather practical things, I think. Um, I start out by describing, I'm sorry, some of these pictures are not translated fully, but this is a way of describing how has private and public consumption changed over the years, over, from the 1950s. You can see here that we had some rather lucky years here with a rather large growth in, in, in private consumption, this is where everybody got their cars, etc. And then it has kept up being rather good. We also had in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s very large growth of the public sector. This is when all the hospitals and daycares, the, the schools, etc. were built and, and all these institutions. But then eventually this dropped. So now we have a very small growth in the public consumption. If you want to see the pictures, you should sit somewhere else. <laughs> now there is a, a, a slogan, a mantra, sort of in Sweden, saying that we should really go for care to schools, etc. So then, of course, one asks, what, what do the public authorities suggest for the nearest future? Which one would they? They say we should grow in the future. Can you guess? Otherwise, I'll give you the answer. This is what they say. In the future, we should have an increased growth in private consumption, but still no growth in the public consumption. This is how the, 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 the ministries calculate these things. They're not really forecasts. They are the way they, they expect things to, to run. 
this is of course not not good for the environment for one thing, and perhaps not good for, for other reasons also. But let me back a bit. This is the approximate division between work done in, in the business sector, providing us with a lot of, of consumables, and the public sector, which gives us schools and hospitals and, and those things. You can see there are about 2 billion hours of work put into this sector and 2 billion hours per year in that sector. And somehow these have to balance each other because at least in, in the countries like Sweden we think that schools and hospitals etc. should be free or more or less free of charge. So they somehow you have to have this sector to pay for that sector in one way or the other. Now what hap what's happening here is that um, the expectations are that this sector, business sector, will expand, will produce more, because it's getting ever more efficient. They can produce more per hour, so that production will increase which means that they will also be able to provide uh, money to pay for this public sector. But there will be no increase, no, generally, in general, no increase in the services provided by this sector, because that sector has, um, well, mainly, mainly consists in giving you your time. If you're a teacher, if you're working in a care system, etc., your work mostly depends on giving your time. And you cannot that make that efficient without changing the quality of it. This is called, the, in English, the Bomol's dilemma. Have you heard about this? So what we, we can expect, according to these reports, is that we should have more stuff and same level of services. And of course, many people say that that's not good because we don't really need more stuff. We need, or at least we need better services. But if you do so, this, this will tip over. And there's a proposal that you should add perhaps 1% per year in the standard of this, which should be compared to say 3% of this standard. But all the same, we will tip. So something has to be done about it. I drew it as if you would uh, provide some sort of balloon that lifts us up by increasing the taxes. And you would have to increase the taxes very considerably to pay for these services. Because, because salaries, of course, in a country must have some sort of level. If, if these people working in business sector produce more, they can have higher salaries, uh, they can get higher salaries. But then of course people in the public sector will also demand to have these higher salaries, um, which means that you cannot provide more services. This is the Bumol's dilemma actually, which is hardly understood by the politicians in general. They all say that, oh, the more we produce here, here, then we can have more of that, which is not actually true. Well, it, it, it could be true in, in one way. It could be true if you say, okay, why don't we put in more people, more hours here, and produce even more here, so that we can pay for this. But this is when you get into real trouble, environmentally, because we cannot provide them. I'm standing here, and these are the pictures that you're supposed to look at. So you better see, you better see it somewhere else. Okay. Maybe there, here. Okay. So you have all these three alternatives here. And, and um, if you have this productivity-led growth, you cannot afford more public services. It will require higher taxes or even more private consumption. Because so that's uh, this is the impossible alternative because already today about 80 to 90% of the environmental load 
is on this side. So we cannot, we cannot really pursue that, that road. And, and, and we have to reduce our, our consumption somehow, maybe to go from 10 to 1 ton of, of per capita in order to be sustainable <coughs> society. So this is a big problem. How, how do we achieve these things? Um, you got a solution? <laughs> Let's look for it. This is a very simple way of describing the economy. You have a black box of production, things go into it, <laughs> it goes labor into it, it goes what's called manufactured capital out of it, capital comes out of it, machinery, factories, roads, infrastructure, whatever, and things for consuming. Uh, there are some more no, sorry. What's happening? I don't get the right picture. There are more things, of course, going into it, I should say. There are, are uh, these uh, sort of free goods going into it, like air, water, etc. And there, is, there are things coming out of here. Uh, waste, uh, pollution, etc. I won't draw it, I can't even find the picture now, somehow. Um, but I will also leave that out of, out of the picture. But of course we know all this about the externalities, which you should internalize, etc. Uh, that, that is a discussion that I would skip. Because I would say this is... The idea of this one is that we live in a... a scarcity economy. So the, the production here must somehow be divided. How much can we afford to consume and how much capital do we have to produce in order to invest it, in order to increase the, the manufacturing capital so that we can increase production. This is some sort of a cookbook of, of economic growth. You could call it also the, the, the capitalist capitalism 1.0 or something like that. Um, yeah, here, this is the picture I was looking for. It came in the same order. You got the natural resources, you had the, the emissions. But the point is that we are getting ever more efficient in, in this type of production. We are going into, into uh, we're leaving the economy of scarcity. We, we go into an economy of abundance, where the higher productivity in this sector gives more output. And just to give you a figure of that, because the, the production has increased about three times in Sweden in 50 years. Three times more to consume in 50 years, with essentially the same input of, of labor. So there are tremendous changes if you go over a long time. Problem arises, how do we go about consuming all this? A whole new sector has, has appeared telling us that we should consume, that we should buy advertising, marketing, etc. in order to get, get this consumption consumed. Well, you're laughing, but it's not to laugh no, about. No, it's a really serious. Yes, to make you happy. It's the yeah. <laughs> consuming. Yes, yeah, you're happy. happy. You <laughs> and why do we do this? Of course, the the, 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 the business is interested in selling and in growing, etc. But we should also realize that that in politics, politicians are extremely scared of unemployment. Unemployment is about the worst thing, and if the fact, if we don't buy, the factories will stop and people will get unemployed. So you have, you can really say that all this is in order to create work so that people will be employed or will be, could, can be employed. I won't go into much of detail, but, but 
This is an economy of abundance. The capital is 2.2 or something. 2.0. Only, again, this is not the end of the story either, because it's really a simplification to say that only two things go into here, manufacture, capital, and work. You could also say that there is what the, the economists like to call natural capital. There are things going into the production which come from nature. I mean, there's no use having a sawmill unless you have forests. There's no use having a fishing fleet if there's no fish in the seas. So there's a, a play between these two, and this will put eventually the, the lack of natural capital will put some end to the growth of, of production, of consumption of capital. And then again, of course, this will bounce back to the issue of work. So we have a very complicated links here that we have to explore. I, I would like to call this capital 3.0 or something, or other interpretations of that as well. I should say that if you have any quick questions, it's okay with me. I intend to go through this uh, report or this description and then we can have a break and then we can come back and have more of a thorough discussion if you like. But if you, you're welcome to have any quick questions. Well, if not, question number one, what is sustainable? Well, I say that roughly we have emissions of about 10 tons per capita in Sweden today. And we should go down, get down to perhaps one ton to have a truly sustainable world. And some people would say, okay, let's follow this line. I say that's not impossible, that's not possible because that will create very large problems here at the end where you have to have very large changes in, in your emissions. You have to employ a system where you go down by the same percentage each year. Just like you, you have economic growth, you know, that is a sort of exponential curve going up, counting on the last year all the time. The same thing happened here. You have to go down by the same percentage each year. So if you, if you look for 2030, you cannot be up here. You have to go down here, which is about three tons per capita. So that's the goal. And you, have, you realize that this is 70% down, which is much more than any political group in Europe or Sweden suggests today. But I think it's, it's only fair. I mean, if, if we say that we're going to be sustainable here, we should also be here on the, on the, on the way down. But what we have in this little block, black box of production is a continuous increase in productivity, in efficiency. We're producing more and more every year. <laughs> which I suggest is like, like going on an escalator. 2% more efficient means 2% two more, two more production each year, as long as we don't change anything else. So what can we do about it? it is not productivity slowing down, no. though? Sorry? It is not the uh, rate of productivity slowing down today? <laughs> not, not really. Um, of course, if you have a, well, we get to that, if you change your balance so that everyone works within those sectors which don't have a productivity increase, then it will slow down the, the average. But so far, no. That's not, not, not a very, not, I mean, there is a little, ten, there are small tendencies, but, but uh, productivity is not going down. It's going up. It, it uh, seems to be in, in disagreement with the community of economists that kind of uh, it seems that the consensus today is that uh, technological progress measured as an in, increase in, in uh, productivity of factors of production is slowing down overall. So I, I would like to see how you, on which kind of data or on which kind of reasoning you can 
raise yourself to argue the opposite, that productivity is still speeding up? Um, speaking of, of productivity of labor, you may have heard about the book The Second Machine Age, which is a book suggesting that a half of the jobs will be gone in, in let's say, 20 years due to this increase in productivity. I mean, the, the increased use of, of robots, of, of digitalization of work, that is also a productivity increase, which will take away jobs. That's what I'm talking about. That is being counterbalanced with the fact that most of the jobs are being created in the service economy where there's limited potential for mechanization, so overall productivity still decreased. I will argue. You haven't the productivity in the service sector is not is, is mixed. I mean, in, in those which means giving your time, as I mentioned before, is not increasing so much, or hardly at mm -hmm. all. In other sectors, it's increasing extremely fast because you have you're using computers and digitalization. So you can't say that overall. Well, we can come back on that. Part. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I mean, in general, to you and to everyone, I, I, I should say that I'm taking sort of a helicopter perspective here. I want to go over a large field and I want to give you an overall picture. And, and there are, are, are sort of details in this which I cannot go deep into. I don't think they changed the general picture, then, as you suggest. Um, the problem is that, that we are sort of beyond, well beyond this sustainable level. We should really be down somewhere there. So we will have to find some means of, of, of going down on this ladder. And there are, of course, this escalator. And there are, are, of course, environmental improvements going on all the time. I mean, everyone is changing. The laws are changing. The companies are changing their output. People are behaving, in, in, in most or many people are behaving in, in, in an in a environmentally sound way. So, so there are things going on, but they're rather small, perhaps 1% or a little more per year. So we have to do much more about it. We have to be, be stronger about it. Um, put it simply, I could say that this going down here by 70% is like making a, a, a and sort of reducing this whole stable here. And if you have today a, a level of, of minus 2%, you would have to increase this, the speed of it like this. You have to increase by cleaner technology and by other lifestyle, you can sort of increase the speed of it and you can reduce this one. But you cannot, it's not practical to go all the way. I have suggested here, okay, maybe 5% is okay. Uh, I think 4% is also very strong. Uh, but the point is really that, that we cannot make it all by technological changes. Uh, I mean, there are, look, there are changes we can do. Volkswagen has offered what they call a one liter car. It wasn't really so good. It wasn't a one liter car because they had a battery also. But uh, there are also changes in lifestyle. Uh, you can, and, and these things perhaps go together. And there are op large opportunities to do it. Um, but there are also problems about it. Have you heard about the rebound effect? They're all, all aware about it. Good. I've written a report about it, but I won't go into it. It's really one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, to make use of the technological improvements in, in, in the society in a social way, to, to, to match these two together, which we have failed so far completely. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that we, we must somehow reduce the increase or the growth of the economy. And the, the simplest thing is, of course, by working less, by reducing the working volume so that we, we get more free time. I have suggested here that if we go down to 5%, 
then you can also do work less, you can reduce the volume. And somehow here, if you introduce a 30 hour week and a very, very tough um, reduction, technological reduction or lifestyle reduction, then you may even achieve this very tough 70% decrease. But it's a combination. It's very important that this is a combination. Now this, of course, raises a lot of questions. This is sort of the, the end of the beginning of what I want to say. It's not the end of the discussion. Because around these pictures, there are, are a number of questions that one has to, to discuss. I try to do it in my book. I hope there will be a discussion about it. But, but we have to face a lot of problems. What will happen about the, about the pensions? Do people really want to work shorter hours? I mean, this is a, a today in Sweden, this is a non issue. No one except, or there's only one or two minor parties which are suggesting it, and, and the rest of the, of the political spectrum, nobody speaks about shorter hours, even if it is one of the most important things that we should discuss. Um, isn't, some people say, oh, we have to work more in order to achieve the transition. I say no, because we have this productivity increase that, that outpaces the other things. Um, an important question is, of course, we have achieved higher productivity by various means, by technological means, by, by institutional means, by, by uh, training people, etc., etc., um, but also by means which are not good in a more general sense. I just have to mention agriculture, to mention how the way we treat animals in agriculture, etc., to say that productivity growth is not really good in any sense. So maybe all these figures should be adjusted to a more, to sort of a better life for the pigs or for the chicken. And that, of course, may reduce the productivity increase. Now, this is not what you're talking about. This is an idea that, that all productivity growth is not good for us, we're good for society, and maybe we should have the means to reduce it in, in a good society, or to, to lessen it, not reduce. Um, I, I won't go into all these things, we can perhaps discuss it if you like, uh, but the, 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 the really, perhaps the really important question is, should we really create jobs? <laughs> Because this is what the political debate is very much about today. How we create jobs, how can we create jobs? Anyone who can, who can create jobs is, is regarded as, as a hero of society. Keynes, J.M. Keynes was perhaps the most influential economist of the, of the last century. And he wrote a book, he wrote an essay, I should say, called The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. And he wrote it in, in 1930, in the middle of, midst of the crisis, where he was pointing to this increase in productivity which is going on. He said, this is the most steady tendency we can see in the economy that we are getting, getting more and more efficient all the time. And he was sort of spanning over hundreds of years. Um, and he said, I, I think that we may eventually solve the production problem. And by the production problem, he means to satisfy our needs. He said, we can probably do it with less work. He even said that maybe my grandchildren will only have to work 15 hours per week to satisfy their needs. And then I started thinking, of course, that 1930, his grandchildren, that could have been me. And I didn't work in a 15 week, 15 hours a week. 
for my people in my life. We don't work 40 hours. Instead, we have had this threefold increase in consumption. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should go down to 15 hours, but I think he points out really that work is not the goal of our life. It's a means of leading a good life. It's, it's a wonderful short essay. If you get hold of it, you, you should read it because it's written with a lot of wit and, and worth reading. I wrote eventually a book called Cain's Grandchildren. And as you may suspect, this is my granddaughter, just to follow through here, <laughs> um, which was published when I was seven. And which is really the first book that, that put these things together. But I, I'll leave that for the time. <laughs> um, and I want to be a little more concrete again. As I said, I, I'm an engineer, I want to have figures, I want to see things in figures. I tried to look into some of the various fields whether one could achieve a 70% reduction within those fields. So I made sort of a stair stepping down, like this one for, for car traffic. I said that, yes, there are a lot of things we can do in order to improve, to reduce emissions within this system. Electric cars, for one thing, I think it's, it's perhaps the most important thing. And then other changes in organization. <coughs> Bicycles are very popular. Um, what are system effects? Sorry? What are system effects is simply that once you don't have... Who has? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> once you have less cars, maybe you have less parking space and you can make cities more efficient, etc. I mean, there are all sorts of more things. Mm -hmm. This is a very small thing that I just put in. Um, Popular to speak about things. Bicycles. Let me just point out how versatile is the bicycle. In Copenhagen, people have always gone on bicycle, and, and they do it. And they use it much more, much more than we do. I'd like these little kids sitting eating having their, their snack while they're riding around in Copenhagen. In Bordeaux, they have closed off the, the whole city center. So, DHL, which is a giant company with all these big trucks, etc. But when they get to Bordeaux, they have to unload it and put it into a bicycle again. You just set the laws, you set the rules for it, and, and, and it is impossible. Electric bicycles are coming in quickly. I mean, 8,000 kroner for an electric bicycle is not much more than a good bicycle without a motor cost today. And this is from IKEA in Uppsala, I believe. Yeah, you can... I mean, IKEA was very much built on car, and taking your car and, and buying you your new furniture. But now they're providing bicycles, so you can bring the things home. So the bicycles are coming everywhere. As for traffic, though, I should say that when it comes to flying, I see no means of sort of keeping up the trend. The trend has been an extreme increase. I mean, in 20 years we have three times as much air traffic, and I believe that in a sustainable society we don't have to go down to where, where we were in 1990. Yes? Um, do you know what that would mean for um, uh, every citizen? How many flights um, of which length could we, could we do per year? for 10 years? <laughs> I, no, I, I, think I, I, I roughly say one one trip abroad per year or something like that. That's not. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You mean including all the people that are not flying currently? If we if I you think to, of... I, I, I did this calculation <laughs> a couple of years ago, I can't recall it, but I mean, the, the, the distribution is so extreme. There are so many people making 10 trips per year. And if you read the newspapers every Friday or Saturday, you see these travel uh, sections where they're suggesting that you go to Barcelona for a weekend, etc. I mean, someone called this in Swedish, Mellan Morsevesor, 
snack, snack traveling. I mean, you go for it. You don't. I think you would perhaps go for for one good trip abroad a year, but no, no, none of this. Visit Prague this uh, this weekend, etc. Anymore. That but I mean, very the, the, promising. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I'm trying to be. <laughs> We should also do something about housing because the, the energy used in housing is very large. Uh, unfortunately, this is much more troublesome than, than any other, perhaps. Um, you can, you can ha make houses much better, but you have a very slow rate of exchange. I mean, 1% per year are being exchanged each year, so it would take an extremely long time before. Even if you were to build passive houses, it would take an extremely long time to make good influence. And you can save energy in, in other ways by, by uh, changing, improving the houses. Uh, there were lots of houses being built in the, in the 60s, 60s, 70s in Sweden, and they are due for, for repair now, and you can include better insulation. But I don't believe that we can, can get to, to where we want to go. And this is a problem, and this is where, where, where we may have to adjust ourselves. I looked into these statistics long ago. I made a, a just an attempt to say, oh, what if we let the largest households get the largest houses, and then sort of done? Which means that in 1985, five-person households would live in a six-room apartment, etc., and then it would go down. But the, the, the shortage of housing, in terms of space, at least, was really out by, by 85, when we had built all these houses. You could, one family houses could, or households, they could, single households, they, they, most of them could live in, in two-room apartments. And if I look into the, you can actually very bad data which is available today. Um, you can say that we have increased the, the area of housing and I mean today most of the single houses would live in three room apartments if you divided them fairly. And if they were placed in the right places of course. Unfortunately they are not in Stockholm. And unfortunately everyone wants to go to Stockholm. So there is a, a tremendous shortage of housing. But I think we, we, I, 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 <coughs> we may have to think not in terms of increasing the stock of houses, but rather how are we going to use them? How, who is going to live in what? And just to give you one, one sim simple example of this, this could be described like as a, as a sort of a life history of someone living in a small flat by himself or herself and then finding a partner and then no that wasn't so good so I'm single again and another partner and of course the whole family and the part the, the housing then is, is increasing because in order to, to room all these people and this was actually Sweden's policy of housing that all families should have a good housing and we subsidized housing and we built a lot of houses in order to provide room so that kids should have their own rooms, etc., etc. But the kids grow up, as you know, and eventually the, these people sit there by themselves. It's called the, the empty nest. And these empty nests are really the sort of the major problem that so many people stay on in these houses. I wrote a report about this 25 years ago and calculated that, so this is an old story, uh, but it's still valid. By that time I calculated that if just a, a small min a minority of these people would give up their villas, their large apartments, and let the, the, fam the, the new families with children move in, you could save yourself, in 20 years, you could sell yourself a housing stock of the size of the whole of Göteborg, Gothenburg. So I called the book One 
one you had to boil less, which the people in Yadboy didn't like. <laughs> it wasn't about them, it was about all this sort of rucksack that you were carrying, all these new houses being built, because you could not get the shift over between um, growing families and drinking families. The whole thing is, is now up to discussion again in Sweden with a uh, lot, because, well, for various reasons. But um, also, I should maybe this whole discussion about where do we live, how do we organize so that people you get these chains of movements. It also has to do with, with the, the sustainability. So just a point on this. Um, <clears throat> it's quite, it's almost too, too simple to suggest sometimes this kind of idea of people who live in big houses should give them to larger families, these kind of things. In the UK, um, we had a similar type of discussion and the UK government brought in something called the bedroom tax which is the bedroom tax. So they would tax um, families who lived in social housing if they had more rooms than the amount of people that they needed to sort out the social housing problem. So too many people losing their houses due to financial crisis, needing new housing, um, but because there was a shortage of houses, they wanted to move people who had too many rooms for families who were living in one bedroom, which, but the logic of it made sense but when it actually rolled in, it was a complete, and is a complete catastrophe. You would be taking money away from families who already didn't have a lot of money because they had extra rooms, as the government didn't really analyse the rooms properly and didn't properly look at why they were using those rooms, and then forcing people who had established themselves in communities to move because that housing wasn't correct for them and having to move them somewhere else for somewhere else to come in, and then they were penalised. And it was... So, although this is... Like, it makes logical sense in terms of numbers, the social implications can be horrendous. Yeah. I agree. Just, just I wouldn't use the word horrendous, but... I, I, they, I mean, they are really trouble. And, and interesting to hear that it has been, been tested in the great... Well, I mean, it's still going on. It's and, still going on. And there are families who mm -hmm. cannot... Like they get their benefits stopped and they get fined because they have an extra room. And how, what about people in villas? Well, th that's not. Th th They're the not involved. No, 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 the government are involved in that because this is just for social housing. Ah, so no, so no, just no. the housing oh, okay. that the government can control because oh, you can't okay. tell big... you can't tell private owners to move, but you you can tell. You can you can who... you can have a tax on houses which makes it very expensive to live in a big house, so that you're not... Yeah, I but, guess. But the Swedish government, the, the, the former Swedish government took away the, the, the housing tax, yeah. which all economists say was the stupidest, stupidest thing you could have done. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is really... I mean, you give a good illustration of the types of problems that we may be facing if we, want, if we really want to have a sustainable society that we have to go into these rather you know, sensitive things about people having to move. I have been discussing this ever since I wrote that book, and I suggest that perhaps these old people who, who are getting tired of old lawn mowers and, and snow and, and old problems, that you build a house, a big house for them in the middle of the, of the village or the town, where they can still, they still don't have to move out of the neighborhood, so they can sort of keep the neighborhood, but, but don't have to have the housing that, that's no good for them. And whatever new houses should be built should be adapted to those needs, not to the... If you have, if you have a, a waiting list, a queuing list of lots of families with children, you should not build houses for families with children, you should build houses for those who should move out of the big, you see, so you get the chain moving. But these are, are, are very tricky and, and, and things that people will not be very happy about. So I was thinking maybe that problem kind of came here in Uppsala. They built this industry Stalin, which is uh, apartment buildings, and it was directed for elderly. But only families moved in there, and they didn't have any services, kindergartens or anything. So I guess the people from Villas didn't want to move into those apartments. So families sort of opportunity to find 
housing and I haven't heard about that, but it sounds interesting. And now they're a couple of years later building uh, kindergartens and making it more oh. family friendly. But are there small apartments? Um, I think it, there's different different sizes. Mm. I think most are like two or three. I was involved in, in a project in Stockholm, which is extremely successful for people in what they call the second part of their life, which is a, a cooperative or housing. And, and uh, that has been extremely good. People moved in from. from. But anyway, yeah. we should you know, we should not get stuck. Someone else had a question here. Yes, me. Uh, this is it also related that maybe with some cultural factor that. You know, maybe the Swedish family is a bit more individualistic than the families in other parts of the world where the old people live with their sons when they are older, not only because of economical factor, but also because of you know, familiar cultural thing. Uh, could it be, you know, because here you see a lot of old people living alone in their houses, and I think well, they could all live with their, with their family. But, but these three generation households are not so. I don't know where you're from, but I, I know yeah. about Span, Spain a bit, and I, I think that's the false picture of all Spain, that you have three, three, I don't know, Spain three generation from houses. South America, and there it's very common that grandparents can live also with their families, okay. and mm -hmm. they share a house, and yeah, and uh, yes, I also, I also see. We get into very practical things. Which is perhaps what we should do, but it's also a way of widening. I mean, I'm not talking about energy saving or, 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 or things. I'm talking about very general political issues, as you can see. I'll go on. I have this stair for the food, and these are all these uh, sort of familiar things that one can do about it. But again, it seems that it's very difficult, even the lots of restrictions and changes in habits. And these habits are very so ingrained. Um, I mean, it, it's very hard to change these habits. Uh, and they still will not be sufficient. Um, yes. What was the level of cheese and meat pr um, consumption in 1990? How much were people eating? You have to look into the book. <laughs> Anyone can download the book freely. I mean, even if you can't read it's Swedish, this, you this, can. Uh, uh, live, no, 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 Keynes. No, the other one. Uh, yeah. How to live sustainably. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can make it out. Again, maybe you have to sort of widen the system and look not exactly on the food, but also how we procure the food. I and mean, if you if you sort of move from there to how do we get the food to our house? A colleague of mine made this uh, calculation that. If, if you got the, get the food here and everybody wants to go with their car to that place, it would be about 600, 6,000 kilometers. If you had some trucks delivering the food instead, it would be only 30 or 300 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Tremendous gain in the food system. So these are the, the sort of steps down. I didn't talk about stepping down sort of consumption of, of stuff really but but we could do that also um, now this may be perhaps on the downside of it i want to remind you that there is a sort of upside of it too you would have much more free time leisure time that you could use for anything you like so if i would make some i would say extremely simplified picture what I'm suggesting it would be that maybe we could have in 2030 material standard something like we had in 1990 perhaps or 1980 anyway not very not very way much back in a standard which as you see was pretty good that of course with the technology of 2030 which we know nothing about we just recall that smartphones are five years old and there's 15 years to go to 2030. So there are a lot of things that may be happening. And you would have 10 more free hours per week. So the title of this speech was Living Sustainably. Is that so bad? 
Let us go my question again. This is so bad. How do you avoid the rebound effect if you have 10 hours more free time per week? What do you mean rebound it? As in, people have more time, therefore, surely they consume more if they have more time. If they, they have more money also. I mean, they will not have more money. So you, can go, you can go into this and say that this is definitely a no-growth society for a number of reasons. Uh, if, you want to have, uh, uh, if you want to have a good service, social service, good hospitals, good schools, those people working in those sectors will be a larger proportion of the labor force. So it will be a highly taxed society. And you will not have so much money that you could use your time as you do today. You will probably have to use it in a, in a not so energy-consuming or, or resource-consuming way. Can I make just a, a small comment? Uh, maybe on, on the overall of what we've seen in this course in green economy, we've been many people that uh, come with this a uh, very simplified picture and the direction and we've heard but like we've heard but reducing air transport and, and better housing and, and car efficiency and, and whatever you, you will. But what I like there is uh, your solution, uh, how to get there. It's, it seems a bit, and especially on, on those numbers, there every single one is kind of calling for a specific policy or is calling for a more complex analysis of uh, institutions, to design institutions and uh, dynamic of the market economy and, and poorer relations. So it might be a bit unfair to call this uh, uh, standing at, at, at the edge of, of being naive and, and too simplistic, but I would like to hear that this, this is all fine and I think you're uh, pushing to an open door because everybody will agree to have this. The, the big question is why is this not happening and what kind of like logic are going against the development of this and what kind of policy at which levels can we implement that will make those uh, things possible in a way. Which is what I think okay. what yeah, we're yeah, looking yeah. at here yeah. in this course is really what we're interested in is those policy, those strategies as we kind of all agree to some extent that those small incremental changes my opinion, will be positive, anyway, cannot be harmful. I'm not saying, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm sort of going through, pushing on, on open doors. I think this is, I mean, I started out by saying that we are totally growth oriented. Each, almost every party in, in Sweden, all politicians are growth oriented. Uh, they're speaking in, in very simplistic terms about creating more jobs, etc. And I, I think in the back of it is this fear that people will not accept changes. No, and, I, I wouldn't mean in this room. And I, in this room. Yeah, yeah, okay, in this room, but you're not typical. And I want to be practical, I want to do something that, that at best could have an impact. This is what I'm calling for. This, this is not a strategy, this is not a plan, this will not have an impact because there is no uh, there is no idea there. It's just a vague direction of what we should achieve. But if we don't detail, if we don't discuss how should we achieve this, this remains just the shadow of a plan. This is my point there. I, I'm starting to be very disappointed with the with the, those shadow of the points uh, of 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 a plan. So we need to discuss the implementation and those kind of like policy leverage point that we need to trigger in order to kind of why, create the space for you, this. Why do you think the politicians would not discuss it? But you see, Christer, our role here as uh, intellectuals at university is not only to just tell them, okay, this is the direction, discuss it, find a way. As consultant, we need to kind of like see the, the full picture. What is this going to, how is this is going to impact like the overall functioning of the economy and think about this through. This is not just putting a direction there like the shadow of a plan and let politicians discuss. We need to discuss it first here. So this is what I'm, I'm calling for here in this course, you not know, just like all... You know, of course, I'm in love with the idea of just working less and 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 uh, and uh, traveling in bike and less air traffic. But this is not as simple as this. And if we just expect that through this giving such a project to 
uh, the political side, I think we cannot be uh, surprised if this is not working, this is not happening. So I think we need a deeper uh, discussion about... Can we, can we postpone it perhaps for yeah, a little while? Okay. I'm just finishing off. Um, there is very little knowledge about what, how people react to these things. I mean, you reacted positively and said, well, gee, I will be flying every year. <laughs> but, but that's very unusual, I think. Uh, a colleague of mine, though, made some sort of a study. I just want to present it without standing with it. He, he divided people into deciles and, and said, how much uh, carbon dioxide do they emit? And what is what is their subjective well-being? And roughly, you can see that there is no correlation between this. Whether people are consuming four tons or, or fifteen tons, they seem to be just as happy. But this is a very weak, perhaps the beginning of, of sort of scientific understanding of these questions. Uh, on the other hand, I maybe mean, this is what you you are aiming at. Who wants this growth? What sort of ambivalence do we have among the politicians? I, I call this the pajamas face of the politics, who say that, come on now, you have to be prudent, you have to go on a bike, you have to empty your, your glass, no, your, your milk uh, curtains and, and, and throw them in the right uh, waste basket, etc., etc. And that is what they say on, on the one hand. On the other hand, they say, consume more, because we have to have this system working, we have to have jobs, we have to <coughs> So, So actually we are allowing our politicians to be very, so have the double talk, which is pretty bad. But I, I, I had planned that to either say thanks or to say this is the end of the first part, and let's have a short break, and then we can perhaps discuss a little more the system of, of where things can be implemented or why things are not being implemented. It's a little beyond what I promised to say, but I think it's important. So, so if this is okay with you, for break. I think it's, it's important. This has been a useful picture for discussing these things many times. To say that Our market economy actually has three actors. And between these three actors, you have, you have three relations. Um, a, lot of, a lot of political science deals with only two of these actors, but, but I think it's important to make this triangle and <coughs> to realize that, that within this relation, of course, people here are consumers or they are employers and the market arena. But they are also citizens versus the political class on the, on the political arena. And this opens up discussions on how, what, what, what changes do we, can we assume. A lot of discussion, for instance, goes about consumer power in the sense that the consumers, when they consume, should choose the things that are the right to do environmentally. And that should send a signal to the producers and that, that, that way you can change things. Um, to me that is okay, but it's not really a very efficient way. I think perhaps we are underutilizing this relation with people perhaps telling the political class that we want those regulations for the production which you should impose on the production this way. This relation is very well known. This relation is very well known. Um, this relation is definitely not an arena. It's something that goes on very much in, in, in hiding um, all the pressures, all the lobbying, all the things that go on things that are, are worrying a lot of political science, scientists very much. I mean, how, how Washington is, 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 in Washington, how, how capital and business are really ruining the political system, etc. This is 
a very very vivid discussion, I should say. And, and you have you can just pick any topic today and see how this this fight goes on. If you take this uh, TTIP system, that where where the, the uh, um, companies are pressing to have an agreement on on on, on a lot of things, environmental issues, on dispute settlement, etc. It's really something going on here where, where in, in this relation where the EU is today struggling with, with rules in, to impose upon business. You have the REACH agreement, etc. All of these are, play, are, are showing the relative powers within this relation. This is one point of it. Another I will just mention briefly, I go back to Machiavelli, who wrote something very clever about changing things. He said, it's very difficult to change things, to introduce a new order of things. And this was written in the 1532. Because the innovator has for enemies all those that have done well under the old condition, and lukewarm defenders and those who may not may do well under the rule. That is, every time politicians or, or people suggest introducing some something which is environmentally sound, it will benefit perhaps all of us, it will benefit our coming generations, but all of us are sort of lukewarm about it, and the new generations don't even have a voice. Whereas those industries or those towns or regions that would be hit by the new regulations will will sort of master every defense in, in, in for the for the present situation. So this is a, a built-in problem in all sort of changes in these directions that you have this asymmetric interest, specific interest for those who are who stand to lose, and very general and, and perhaps uncertain for those who are to, to gain. Um, one more final issue. When we're speaking about relation, for instance, between people and the political class, we think of it as, as people telling their members of the parliament or something, but it really doesn't work that way, in, at least not in Sweden. Most of the, the pressure on the political class comes from organizations which we all belong to, to in some sort of capacity. I mean, if we have house owners, we have our organization. If we have bicycles, go on a bicycle or car owners, we have our organizations for that. If we are patients within the, the hospital or the medical service, we have our organizations for that. And all those organizations pressure the political class on behalf of their members, on, on behalf of the specific limited interest of their, their members. And I think that if I were a politician, I would get the impression that it was really, really bad. If every day I had to meet this organization and hear how bad the situation is for their members, it may give a very strange picture of how people really think about things. It may be that we have, in, in, in this country at least, some sort of an organized dissatisfaction where people are not really so dissatisfied in general, but you get the impression that they're dissatisfied because all these organizations are, that's their, their reason for, 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 for existing, is that they should complain on behalf of their members and the members' in, members specific interest. So these are some of the complications, but in, in general perhaps, and I, in general we could, could perhaps discuss how to go about things within this triangle. So that should be my last picture. I should say that I have a home page if someone wants to read more or see more, and there is an English section on that also. Enough. I'm not leaving yet. I have to leave at 11. <laughs> now we can discuss. 
So maybe I can start with a question for you. Uh, let's say, Christer, uh, you are now dictator of the world. So you have all power. You can do whatever you want. Uh, what will be the policy you would implement? What do you think will be the, the most important thing to do, let's say, only at this, on, in, in Sweden? Then what will you do? Can be a legislation, can be any type of economic policy. Is that really an interesting question? I'm not a dictator. No, I don't no, want to be a dictator. I, I, I never thought of being. I, I mean, I started out here at nine o'clock saying that people are in power, but people have their opinions. People think, have their notions about what a change or sustainability would mean. Politicians react to that and say, we dare not um, challenge people uh, about this. So I want to go in and interfere here by saying it's not so bad. And some of you seem to agree that this it would not have to be so bad if we did all these changes. So I wanted actually to give the politicians more courage to come up with the solutions uh, which we can all discuss. But what will be your favorite solution? Let's say after all, all your, based on, on what you've been researching and, and discovered over the years, and what really is your favorite solution, the favorite change you would like to see happening in, in Swedish society? <laughs> um, I, I just, I'm, I'm not going to read the answer to your questions really, but I would say the most, the thing that has kept me busy wondering is why did we stop shortening the work week or the work hours because I wrote my I, I'd been into this for from since 75 or something what, what about how much do we have to work I wrote a book called how much work is needed uh, implying that we would get a better living standard all this efficiency gains productivity gains and I figured out that we should have a six hour six hour day working working day in by the shift of the century. And this was actually what all political parties in Sweden said. We got our forty hour week in nineteen seventy three. And by nineteen seventy three all parties except the conservatives said this is just a, a, a step on the way to a six hour day by, and we should achieve it by 2000, that is 15, 14 years ago. And then that suddenly was wiped away. Nothing came out of it. And, and if you want to say what I think is most important, is really to resume this. Because we are twice as, we are twice as, as rich as we were when we introduced the 40 hour week now. We're twice as rich. So there's really room for it. But given this uh, Janus phase and whatever, you see that, and, 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 the, and the, the growth imperative or the growth notion, we have not achieved it. So my, my main question is, why don't we stop it? If you ask people, and then, yes, I do have, I may have the picture. If you ask people, you will find that, if you ask people, would you, like, would you like a higher salary or would you like more free time? Most people say free time. And all the same, no trade unions, no political parties really push that issue. The Green Party in Sweden used to do it 10 years ago, but they, they're not really strong on it anymore. If I can find picture.
this for one is a, is a survey made in 1989 by a government committee asking people how would you like to use uh, increased productivity and you can see the result very few people were actually interested in increasing the private consumption half of them said shorter hours and some say improve public services and what do you think the committee said no shorter hours within any foresight i mean when you look into this they're not suggesting any shorter hours between before 2050 but this was in 1989 i'm, I'm yeah you have a question? Yes, exactly. I, is it me? No, yeah. yes. Um, I would really like to go into one um, particular um, example and try to find out why why there is such a probably um, systematic um, resistance against this. Like, I think what uh, what we we haven't done so far in this whole course is kind of to go into one of those particular suggestions and try to find out so how would it really work and I think most of us would really like to do that and maybe you could help us with thinking this through um, I don't know how about the others but in terms of this what you were saying that we should have a six hour working day and we choose a particular case in a maybe an industry and try to figure out what it would mean for the whole economy if, it, if this was implemented. I mean, then we could maybe discuss and maybe we would find um, a reason why, why it's not, why this idea doesn't get implemented or something like that. Because it's so, I mean, it, it seems appealing to me as well. This is what I want to do in my life. I want to work less <laughs> um, and still change the world. I mean, um, so why, why don't we discuss this in more detail? Is that um, in your line also? I have a question with, so I have a comment with regard to working time. Okay. Which is maybe um, interesting. So in Austria, so I've seen the, a similar chart that until the 80s the working time increased in Austria. And there was also no trade union policy, but now in autumn 2013. Um, so in Austria, all the collective uh, contracts, working contracts, are um, negotiated between unions. And now the first time we had the options for the for workers in the electrician sector um, to choose whether they want to use the productivity in terms of uh, increasing income or in terms of reduced working time. So they had the option to choose, and the outcome was that only about ten percent of the workers choose a reduced working time, and ninety percent of the workers decide went for a higher income, and. So maybe I would be interested in your comment on that. So what could be reasons for that, maybe? And secondly, I know there is research on this topic, so there are two pieces written, written on that, but unfortunately I don't know the findings yet. That would be interesting. Do you think there is any chance that there is maybe a shift again in the interest of the unions towards less working time? Maybe that's one question which is interesting. And the second one would be, um, uh, what do you think is the reason why people don't opt for short working hours? Also, a survey, for example, in Sweden suggests they would say yes, actually, we want. But if they have the decision, they don't go for it. I mean, um, th this, this question has been put many times, and usually you end up with something like 50 50 one or the other. I mean, sometimes they complicate the questions by, by asking if you, could, if you could choose your own times, the working hours in the day. So, I mean, there are complications, but generally um, that question, what I call a, a we question, how should we do it in, in society? Then there is the, the you and now question, which is, do you want to go home two hours before the rest of the people in your place, in your working place? And that would only about one out of six say yes. And this is perhaps what, what you have encountered in with the electricians, yeah. that, that uh, we are very social beings. And we want to consume like everybody else consumes. We are much influenced by that. 
And we also want to have the same pattern as, as everyone else. And this is why I always stress that there are norms about how to work. There are no norms for what is full-time. And this full-time norm is extremely strong. A lot of people tell me that, oh, you're talking nonsense about the short hours because our working life is so individualized that there are no working times anymore, etc. I don't think so, because I think this norm is still very important. And this is why I always stress that this is something that we have to do collectively. That we have to sort of go on and say, let us together implement these shorter hours. Maybe if I were a dictator, I could say, yes, we're shorting down to 30 hours. <laughs> Plus. Okay, so it will be illegal for a company to force their employees you to work, or to, will it be like just... Like the simple American way, uh, you get a 50% higher payment over right. 50, 30 hours. Who would employ someone in those conditions? I mean, that's a very simple way. So, you're shorting the hours but increase the weight? Is this... No. So no, you can, but, you but cannot happens, increase. You cannot increase the wage. But what happens to those people who, because it's, it's assuming that people are going to get paid enough, and are currently being paid enough, to be able to reduce the hours and still be able to live. Like yeah. I, I know people who work fifty hours a week, and it's just enough to survive. Yeah, I know, and this is why why this discussion goes on. For instance, with people working in yeah, services. Uh, the, the trade union for, for those working in, in, in public services, they were actually the last group to favor shorter hours. But a few years ago, they gave it up because they said, our salaries are so bad. I've had discussions with this. People are more, more weeping when we discuss it. And, and, and evidently, we know that, that the, 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 the gap between best paid and worst paid are, is growing in Sweden, like in, in most countries. And this is a, a very tough problem. I said, just said that we, we have become twice as rich as we were in 1973. But this we is of course qualified. I mean, some people are not at all much richer. If you take the American economy, apparently something like 90% of the growth has gone to the top, top 10%. I mean, there's an extreme uh, JM. Yeah, in balance. So, so I mean, if, if Americans don't talk about, if ordinary Americans don't talk about shorter hours, I can very well understand it because they haven't seen any pay rises in the last decades to speak of. So, but then, then there, this is part one part of the truth. Then there is also the, well, uh, why can't you achieve it? Yes, because you have to consume more or less like everybody else. You have to have a new flat TV, you have to have new, you know, these things that go on. Um, we are, as, as consumers, we are pretty much locked in, as I say in one of these papers. We are locked, locked in into, into structures that force us, more or less force us to consume, if, even if we are not so fond of it. I was thinking, I mean, I work 75%, I do have 30 work week. No, you work 30, you don't like. You, you know, you're referring to the norm again. <laughs> um, but I don't know what will happen when I go on pension because the state scares you that women, you should work full time and otherwise you won't get pension and you should not take leaves. And so I think that's a that scare you to work full time, full time or overtime for the future because there's an insecurity. I don't need to consume much now, right now. I don't get much money. I'm a PhD student with a lower. 75% wage, that's fine, I get along, it's okay. But I don't know what will happen when I, if I get to retire one day, um, because this time that I'm working less will affect the future. Um, and there's a scary picture for a lot of people that it is. must work now. It is, it is a scary picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and the individualized, I mean, we had used to have a fairly good pension scheme and now it's becoming more or less uh, responsibility for the individual. You know, if you speak about women. But this 
again, like when I was talking about the housing, it shows that creating a sustainable society goes into every issue that is in politics. Pension schemes, housing schemes, food, oh, everything. More of them, some of them have discussed a lot, I mean, like transport and, and, how, and food, etc. But we also have to include pension schemes. Justice, justice, just fair uh, salaries, uh, lowering the gap between the uh, best paid and the best paid. How many have read picketing? It's really an eye opener. But I did a question, or did you read picketing? Yeah, yeah, I'm French, so uh, <laughs> that was also my. I'm a French economist, so yeah, of course okay. I, I read picketing. <laughs> Uh, and I also found it very enlightening. I was just wondering about this issue of uh, economic inequality and which kind of policy will be, because that, that is true, then like low income earners, even though uh, the, 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 they, they will be the one taking the opportunity to, to work more, those extra hours, and we see that already in, in France, we have those like extra hours where you need to pay uh, from 50% more to even like 100% more. And, this is like the low income earners that are taking this as an opportunity to work more, to, to make a bit more money, and then it's not that much to feed back into the consumption norm, and it's just, you know, for the, like most of the, the expenses goes into like uh, food and, and housing and uh, whatever else, like uh, education and, and savings for, for children. So I, I really want uh, overall us to think how uh, the, the high rate of economic inequality can be a hinder for a 30 hours work week and then the question will be what can we do uh, for example you were talking about like the wage ratio and one policy to to fix this is the idea of a maximum wage so I, I wanted to ask you what do you think for example about the maximum wage and would you uh, what would you what would you do? What would you argue if, if once again, let's uh, to think in concrete and practical terms, I think we always need to assume that the government of Sweden is knocking at your door and asking, uh, Christa, okay, we have this issue of economic inequality and we really want to reform the labor market, but uh, what should we do? <laughs> well, if you ask me today, I should say reverse what the government did in the last eight years. <laughs> what was it exactly? Can you? Oh, uh, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting, uh, the, 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 the government that we've had for the last eight years, the, the, the distribution of goods starts, if you go into the D side, it's like this, the distribution goes like this, I mean, the give to the, the, the more, the, the richer they are, the more they got. And I saw a similar curve now for, for, for the new government. You know, but you don't know whether they get through, but they at least had a curve a bit like this, a bit Robin Hood type, taking from the rich and giving to the poor. In forms of taxes or how? Yeah, taxes, taxes. and subsidies. And, <coughs> but I mean, if you look back to what the Swedish government did in the last years, taking away um, housing taxes, taking away inheritance tax, taking away uh, wealth tax, etc. All these things that Piketty speaks about. You probably have to, to, to go, go back, get back to that. Piketty has some, some proposals, actually, about taxing the rich better, more. I mean, Piketty's proposal is a world tax on, 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 on capital, so yeah. I think that's as naive as it gets. But uh, I, I no, I will see this as... I didn't know that in Sweden they actually just... Uh, get rid of those uh, taxes. So I think that would be a good first step to, to bring it back. The, the issue is just with... Uh, uh, I should be afraid. Perhaps it was not only eight years. Maybe even the Social Democratic government mm. did, started this uh, tendency oh, before right. that. Yeah. But it, it has been... Accelerated. It also the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. the Social Democrats too. So they changed in they favor of the rich. They took it very well. Yeah. Mm. It's not perceived yeah. as it's no, no, and then the Swedes look at those two. Uh, <laughs> the <Austrians laughs> said, oh, they did it, so we can what, do it. <laughs> what is the argument for that? I mean, why is this happening <laughs> everywhere? Why? Well, in Austria, I maybe, maybe if we can get back to this triangle, you can say that, that 
business capital has sort of gained the upper hand on the political, political system and, and we have to sort of reverse that trend if we believe in, 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 in democracy. I have to voice my discontentment regarding this uh, triptych you have, which I think is uh, simplistic and, 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 and too reductionist of uh, our society that actually functions. So I think it's, it's not a useful framework for us to see uh, what can we do. And on the issue of, of lobbying, is just the idea of lobbying is a wonderful thing. This is what we're talking about for sus sustainability, is that we want to have more feedback loop to make like uh, businesses more evolutionary and kind of like be able to just okay this regulation is maybe uh, create adding like uh, inequality pressures but this is good the problem of course is that more companies and, and corporations have uh, the ability to lobby more than that but after it's not just capital business as a kind of like well, I think we could create many more uh, legal nodes and the, those relationships, is, or I don't know what you think about this, but from when I see these triangles, I'm actually more confused that is, this is not, I think this is not helping me to understand where, where to act there. Same thing, capital business, can, 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 it cannot be a category. What about different sectors, uh, you know, starting with private sector, public sector, as did in the beginning. And after, you know, could we compare like a transnational corporations uh, next to a local like cooperative or non-profit uh, or and where does the NGOs fit and all like the, the think tank which stands between I guess the, the people and the government to counterbalance like the, the business type of, of lobbying and, and, and as you say people are, are they really a category in themselves as you say people they have different type of identity they are both like they are CEOs they are uh, they are consumers they are uh, advocates the members of parliaments all the also, the members of parliaments also buy groceries. They are consumers as well. So, uh, I don't know if I'm just, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I kind of had the same thought because we are in group three and we had uh, this literature to talk about. And yeah, I would just also maybe say, yeah, it's, it is simplistic in a way. And also this category of people because we all have these different roles. But I, what all I missed during all these discussions was like that nobody talked about I, like myself, because we all make up the economy and we all are part of the political class here. So it's not politicians, people, business. I think it's very much about I and myself and how I act. And this is my point when I looked at this picture, that it um, shifts away um, the res responsibility from yourself. So this was my thought on this, mm. and yeah, I think it is dangerous to have it maybe in this simplistic way, but then you said it's simplistic. But I think it can be really um, kind of disturbing or confusing, yeah. And so I'm, I'm not used to people having read my papers, but I see you have it in front of you. Yeah, I hope, I hope what, I we do. thought it's a good discussion <laughs> point. So it is I so hope I, I, I do the point here that, you, you, that you're making that, that, I mean, I'm speaking about actors, the three, the, the three actors in society. And one person can, of course, be an actor in each of these corners of the triangle. And, and society would not go together unless you said CEOs buy, 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 buy groceries, groceries and, and they have children and they go to school and, and I mean people are of course more or less members but it is you can you can by, by making them actors you can see how they act according to the interests of that group and, and then there are conflicts in how they behave because they are they are humans who have a little bit of each, or they go, they move, they go from one from one place to another in the corner. But uh, if they didn't, society would not stick together; it would fall apart. But I mean, I, yes, it is simplistic. It is simple, and it's good to discuss from a simple yeah. point of view. You do, yeah. I think it's time. Because actually, that clock is a little bit slow, so it's three. Oh, oh. So I yeah. Um, then I I will. Uh,
perhaps stop here. Any any urgent question? Otherwise, I leave it to you to discuss. I hope I'm giving you some 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 sort of input for your discussion.